So Kunkawi will be our last speaker and he won't be too long. Well, thank you very much. You will be very disappointed if you want to know how many times Joy ISIS. I joined ISIS 2009. I pledged allegiance to him, to Dinan. So this is a very grim uh, forum, you know, no smile. I think everybody would take arms after this uh, forum. Having said that, I, I have uh, three points. One, I know that uh, Thailand is a good place, have all the ingredients to be an incubator because we have to develop from a transit uh, point into something else. But before I say that, I will focus on three uh, issues that I think will be the game changer. I think uh, one of the issues has been dilute, uh, alluded to by Professor Joha, that is alternative media. I will focus on additional two issues. We do not have uh, alumni of the Afghanistan. Some Sydney John have said that uh, there were some, but there are two nationalities. You have uh, about 300,000 people living inside Thailand, crisscross uh, Thai, uh, Malaysia. So it's very hard to identify if there is any such ISIS fighter in the future in the Thai. One factor that must put into consideration is the dual nationalities. And this is the outstanding issue. Um, we do, however, have returning students from the Middle East. So there are a lot of uh, distinctions between the before the September 2001 uh, students and right now. And I think the Thai government has been very good in trying to handle this. Uh, this one issue I would like to talk about. And the second issue that I like to talk is the, uh, the alternative media along with the uh, civil society that is very active burgeoning that can dictate the narrative, that can uh, strengthen the voice of moderations and the non-violence cultures which is not uh, holding in Southern Thailand. And thirdly, if the time permit, because uh, this is the year ASEAN is becoming uh, on paper uh, one community, which could mean a lot of things, especially for Thailand because we sit right in the middle of uh, Southeast Asia. We are very easy, uh, a lot of uh, illegals, uh, migrants, the human smuggling use Thailand. You have the, today, the biggest problems that Thailand has is from Xinjiang, the Vigo, uh, asylum seeker. And in fact, today, at this moment, this is the issue of contention between Thailand and China, they're discussing it to find uh, the way out. So taking all this uh, together, you will see that Thailand could turn out to be an incubator if these uh, factors um, have not fostered the positive side now. Let me focus on the return uh, student and the students who are studying in the Middle East. We do not have the exact numbers uh, of Thai students who study in the Middle East. But what we do know is the countries that have developed a very good system in providing scholarship to Thai students, for example, uh, Egypt, Indonesia is one, Pakistan, and uh, one of the least mentioning uh, country uh, in educating the Thai is Sudan. Currently, there are at least uh, 350 uh, Thai students study in Sudan. A lot of people are asking, why Sudan of all this country? And I think uh, if you know the history of uh, Southern Thailand and the way they practice uh, Islam, very traditional, and the way they read uh, Arabic, they want to study uh, the standard, the classic Arabic, and most of them choose to go to Sudan where they uh, can learn the so-called, amongst the believer, the classic uh, uh, Arabic. But most of the students, as you know, the mainstream that you know that's been in the news, that have been receiving the public relation, uh, graduated mainly from the Egypt. Before that, uh, you have the student graduate from uh, at least 34 countries that have been uh, familiar, as far as uh, Yemen, Ethiopia. Uh, this country is getting less because of the internal development. But I like to focus on how these students uh, are living their lives and when they come back, what do they do? But 
what is interesting is this. Um, Thai government is trying very hard to engage the overseas Thai student as never before. This is a very constructive development, which I never thought that it could happen. For example, if you look at uh, the case of Thai student in Egypt, you will see that there is a Thai Egyptian Student Association under the Royal Patronage, which is rather amazing. They have very good activities. Uh, uh, the Thai ambassadors uh, make sure that everybody is happy. This is a very good strategy and is something new. And for example, Pakistan. Uh, the Thai is very concerned with the Thai student in study in Pasantrans, in Varistan, in various parts of Pakistan. Now, Thailand is going to send uh, teams of uh, doctors and social service and all these things, try to provide advice so that to make sure that uh, these students uh, keep in touch with the Thai authorities who will not live isolatedly under any circumstances. For example, if you are sick, uh, you can be sure that there will be Thai doctors uh, thrown in at certain time to take care of you. This is something that I think uh, Thailand is trying to do. Now, in the past, uh, you have students who return. In Thailand, we, as you know, in Pondo and in Thailand, we do not register uh, Ustad. They can teach whatever they like. In Malaysia, uh, Ustad need to be registered before you can pitch sermon. In Thailand, it's free for all. I think the Thai intelligence uh, have always trouble in trying to uh, follow up and translate uh, uh, the sermons that have been carried out in, in southern Thailand. And in this case, I think uh, each has their own brand of uh, belief and teaching. Uh, seven years ago, I volunteered myself in teaching English in one of the local pondo. And it's very interesting. That's where I found out that uh, there are some uh, Thai student graduate from Sudan. And uh, he was teaching, you know, uh, uh, Islam belief and all these things. But for me, I was uh, teaching English. So I realized that in the school of 120 uh, uh, students, you have a very diverse background of Ustad. They're graduates from at least 18 or 19 countries, like Indonesia, Malaysia, Syria, uh, Iran, Iraq. Uh, of course, Syria used to be one of the biggest uh, source of Thai students uh, before the current crisis. I remember the evacuations of the uh, students from Syria because of their fighting and the crisis, and also in Libya. So these, these, student, these students, when they return home, they could be the uh, game changer. So far, if you follow them, they're very traditional. They have discovered, they are actually, uh, Southern, Southern are very cosmopolitan. I was raised in Songkha, and very cosmopolitan Thai politician mainly come from uh, uh, Southern Thailand. One of them is right here. Uh, I did not want to mention the name, uh, come from Patani. Um, they are cosmopolitans because they, they borders the Malaysian Peninsula. They are might wide open vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the top. Uh, if you live in northern Thailand, you are much more familiar with drug trade, you know, Golden Triangles, the Laos, and, and uh, all this. It's not like uh, in southern Thailand. So they are much more open. But yet, when they return home, uh, some of the students are much, what you call, trained in traditional uh, Islamic belief, and this is what they sought to. And I think this is very important that keep the so-called Patani uh, uh, Malay or Patani uh, Satu Patani that's been used uh, so unique. So I think in the future, if this group continue to stay that way, I think the danger of uh, joining uh, ISIS will be uh, very small. And I think the Thai government is trying very hard to engage them, contact, contact them, so to make sure that uh, they they find out and keep contact. In Singapore, for for instance, Singapore government pays scholarship for those who want to study uh, in uh, in the Middle East. In the case of Thailand, all sorts of uh, a scholarship has been given before that. It used to be Saudi Arabia. Now, on record, is the is uh, Egypt. 
when, when I'm talking about the foreign uh, scholarship and foreign funder, I will lead it to the second point. That is the role of uh, civil society in southern Thailand. The rise of uh, the proliferation of civil society uh, in the past 10 years is phenomenal. And I think uh, it's good because it's also highlight the issue, the highlight the so-called social and political injustice that inflicts Thai society that giving rise to this current problem. And I think Thailand need to tackle so that the administration of justice uh, uh, is tangible, not just talk. I think one of the biggest problems with Thailand is that uh, all the rhetoric that come out uh, with the previous government and the current government does not match the situation on the ground levels, even though there are certain uh, good program, but uh, it has not yet uh, produced that kind of uh, result. So you look at the evolutions of uh, civil society uh, in southern Thailand, it starts uh, from uh, law and justice, and then move on to deal with the victim's family, move on into much broader network, and uh, producing the narrative that, uh, put producing the narrative that you do not find in the mainstream media. And in fact, I would argue that this narrative uh, now have entered mainstream media because of the absence of the mainstream narrative, because they are much focused on the political situation in, in Thailand. I will not go into detail uh, because the, of the time constraint. But suffice it to say, um, the civil society in southern Thailand uh, so far is still uh, positive in the sense that they promotes the voice of uh, moderation. They, at the same time, they promote their uh, identity uh, in southern Thailand, which for the government for the authority is pretty nervous because promoting uh, local identity, speak Malays and all this could uh, crash directly with the Thai state. But so far, I think this has been uh, very constructive. So I hope that in the future, the Thai engagement with this civil society, which is, uh, I think, over about three dozens, have all kinds of color. And I mean, you know, later you have Turkey, that is become suddenly very active. You have Indonesia, you have Philippines, you you have Malaysia, which also contributes to all this sort of forming the network of uh, uh, civil society for all various reasons, for the youth, for educating uh, young uh, women and all that. I will not go into detail. And finally, uh, this is a very imp important point, the so-called alternative media. In fact, Southern Thailand today is the most active media, uh, alternative media, the use of social media and all that. So I think these are new factors. Uh, I don't think the Thai authority understand the narrative yet is still at the uh, formation stage. But so far, I think it's very important that uh, uh, the alternative media must also, I believe, speak for the uh, moderation. Why? Because it's important, because Thailand is a very tolerant society, you know, until what happened of, uh, last year. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, the sense of uh, national unity is on various beliefs will be uh, in trouble. And the reason I, why I say this is because both civil society and alternative media, they are very good in detecting signs of conflict earlier, so we have to pay attention to them. Now, finally, on, on one word about ASEAN, because Malaysia is the chair. Malaysia will highlight uh, the extremists, the brutalities. You, you have to observe very carefully. ASEAN, uh, when they come up with the statement, are very careful uh, not to use the words uh, Islam, you know, as I think Johar pointed out uh, very wisely. So I think this year, this will be the big issue, supplant or trumps the South China Sea, just like uh, what Myanmar has done, using South China Sea to trump the Rohingya. Now, my another point is that because of this becoming a community, then the border is wide open. In the case of Thailand, I think Thailand has to pay attention. Otherwise, we'll become the hub for, you know, unintentionally, and it could serve as incubator. I will stop here, thank you. Uh, the floor is open for questions and comments. I think we'll take uh, the next 20 minutes, so we'll, we'll try to wrap up by 11.35. Uh, 
thank you, Kunkavi, for your interesting speech. Uh, I was eager to learn more about the situation in Thailand. And at the very end of your speech, you said a word. You said hub. You worked, you, you hub. We know that Bangkok, through Bangkok, passes many, many flights. And um, uh, Western countries, I think, are very uh, anxious and interested to know what is going on in Southeast Asia, not only as an incubator, but also as a region where people go through uh, before going back to Syria, before going back to Iraq. So can you tell us more about, you know, the movement and displacements of those foreign fighters in the region? Thailand, access to Thailand is very easy. Because anybody now, uh, because of the economic crisis and political crisis, the inconsistency of visa regulation, Thailand is the worst country in the world when it comes to visa regulation because we change constantly. So the numbers of the country shrink and increase uh, depending on the economic situation. And that is very dangerous because uh, in the, uh, before the September 2001, uh, uh, this uh, uh, disaster, some of the uh, people who commit this uh, crime to come to Thailand for r and uh, planning. And I think the Thai has to change its attitude. At the moment, uh, uh, Thailand is driving a new law on terrorism, counter-terrorism, using the September uh, resolution from the UN as a basis. I think uh, it's very important that Thailand uh, uh, toughened its uh, uh, immigration regime for the good re reason. Otherwise, it's very hard to keep track. For example, a certain uh, personal non grata uh, be listed in Thailand. You can travel to Suwannapum. You can never get in. But if you're clever, you go to Malaysia and go to Sadao. And you pass the Sadao or even Laos, you can pro uh, probably pass through. That's what uh, Hambali used when he was arrested in August in 2003. He travels from uh, Cambodia. So with this AEC, I think a new problems arise because the, the um, measures that employs by each country in ASEAN is different. I think Malaysia, Indonesia, the police and all that, Singapore, they have various experience. They, by the way, ASEAN has 2007 con Convention on Counterterrorism, but is not fully implemented. So I think this year, a Malaysia chair will make sure that uh, ASEAN member implemented every measure to toughen it so that uh, uh, you change the balance, including uh, social media. I think uh, this is one of the uh, important, it's not only Thailand, for example, uh, in the case of Malaysia, that uh, for what I know, also Indonesia, social media is very good neutral ground for recruitment. You don't have to be in Syria or originating from uh, in the Middle East. You can do it, the tweeting, retweeting of the message by those who are known and all this like and all this thing can cause much more problems. Thank you. Uh, you said Southeast Asia or uh, you don't use the word ASEAN, but I would put the word ASEAN there. So you said she should pay attention, uh, otherwise the ISIS will, IS will come to, to the region, but we know already that it's here. So uh, my question is that, do you have any more concrete uh, suggestions or recommendations, like what should we do, how do we address this without uh, um, provoking some sentiments uh, because we are like mixed uh, races here. So um, uh, how would you suggest that? Thank you. I'm saying very simply that uh, if IS is allowed to be perceived as even half victorious or half successful in what you call West Asia, spread their strike routes, etc., the ideology and doctrine will flow to the uh, Muslim communities uh, in Southeast Asia. There's no way to stop it. And the thing to do, as I've tried to suggest uh, before, is to try and see whether such great movements 
which I have mentioned, such as uh, Muhammadiyah and the teachings of President uh, Wahid and NU, etc., can somehow be uh, planted uh, amongst Arabs in the Middle East. I don't know that there was at any time an attempt to do that. I know that Gus Dur was thinking about it from meetings with him at the time that he was uh, in office. But uh, it's worth a try. Thank you. Yeah, but I thought if she was asking about whether for us in Thailand um, to be perhaps vigilant or proactive uh, in view of the, uh, the upsurge in violence from IS, uh, what could we be thinking about? I don't think that in the foreseeable future, uh, Thailand, because of IS, is facing any new uh, significant challenges. It's not the time. Now it's the time that IS is being uh, tested in the Middle East, and the forces that are uh, confronting uh, IS, led by the United States, uh, are engaged uh, there. I don't think that the IS is interested in the near future uh, in uh, moving its activities or striking root in this region. You may, be, you may have people in the region, in Thailand, in the south, who would become interested in IS both as an, a doctrine and also a modus operandi. Uh, I'm Niran Donum from uh, Prime Minister's office. Uh, most moderator uh, mentioned about uh, the one way to, to deal with the extremism is to promote uh, moderate Islam to battle with uh, the extremism. Uh, for uh, Professor Minashu even said that we have to plant hope for the, the young people. It, it sounds it this uh, may take time for generations. So, so I wonder whether what should we do? I mean, in for for the short term, what what is the, the alternative in 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 in, in a, a other way for for the long run? Even things that they take generations, uh, they should start immediately. Uh, I think that if you want my honest opinion, I think that we should, the world should encourage uh, the countries with poverty, which is basically the place that this extremism emerge to try and address the socio-economic problems of the weaker strata and to give other solution, to give other hope, to give other direction. Uh, I think that other thing that should be done is to, to make the world wake up. I heard so much about this uh, poor pilot who has been burned. Uh, but this is not a single case. It, it happened recently, it's really very disturbing. But this violation of human rights in the name of Islam is something that should be, the world should wake up and address these issues and stop them and show, I think this is not maybe Thailand, but Indonesia and Malaysia can do much more to show their version of Islam, the, the other one, and help civil society in these countries, women organization, youth organization. And I think that what we see today in the Middle East, we focus on ISIS, and we somehow neglect what happened three years ago with the, with the Arab Spring. I don't uh, underestimate this movement in the Arab world, where the young people go to the street and do what they have done. They have not been successful, but they are ready to go on on the march. We should stress this kind of aspects of Islam, because what is these militant, radical Muslims do? They give bad reputation to religion at all, and in Islam in particular. And I think that's the duty of all Muslims and supporters of humanity to address this issue. This is not religion. Um, I, and I hope I'm not going to add to that reputation with a question. My first question is Please tell us your name and then wait. Oh, I'm sorry, Michael Mackey, I'm a journalist. Um, freelance, but please don't think it means free, anyone who's got any assignments. Um, my question is, my first question, if I can have two, is for Dr. Yari. You, I said that this is an ideological battle 
fought on many levels. I agree with that. But then I caught the inference of what you said later is that that battle can only be won after a military defeat of ISIS. Isn't that a paradoxical solution to be advocating that we need a military victory first before we can have an ideological victory? Because one of the things about the situation in the Middle East is isn't Israel to some extent locked into trying to win a military solution over the Palestinians? Israel would like to seek a two-state solution and have a partner, interlocutor on the Palestinian side, which is unfortunately split between Hamas in Gaza and the Fatah in the West Bank, a Palestinian interlocutor who is willing to make a deal over a two-state solution. So far, uh, the Palestinian answer, on every occasion in which we had negotiations, was, we will come to you later with an answer, and they never do. Just to illustrate, um, our previous prime minister had 36 meetings with the Palestinian president Abbas. At the end of the 36th uh, session, he presented him with a map, which Condoleezza Rice, the American then national security advisor, wrote in her memoirs that seeing what Mr. Olmert was offering knocked her off her feet. Uh, that was basically everything for a Palestinian state with a minimal territorial swap, including Jerusalem. Do you know what the answer of Mr. Abbas was? I'll give it to you. Mr. Abbas said to the Prime Minister, Mr. Prime Minister, thank you, I did not come here to have a lesson in arithmetic. And he never came back. In the last round of the negotiations, the Americans have presented an outline. Mr. Netanyahu uh, had, uh, re has, has come, according to the Americans publicly, has come into within the zone of agreement. Mr. Abbas was uh, called to the White House to see President Obama. Mr. Obama said, well, what is your response? Mr. Abbas said, I'll come back to you. Now to the first part of your, uh, he never did, to the first part of your question. Yes, it's mainly an ideological intellectual war, which has to start and probably has already started now. But you have to stem the tide. You have to uh, 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 reach uh, a new um, a military situation underground to just arrest the momentum of IS. That was partly achieved through the airstrikes. We do not see further expansion of IS territory. But it is my assumption, and many of my American uh, friends, that what it takes, what is ISIS? 20,000 people in the desert between the Euphrates and the uh, uh, Tigris uh, valleys. That's what we have. The main thing is the ideology, of course. It would take a light division, no more than that, to take care of that. Nobody's willing. But it doesn't take more than a one light division. Thank you. Thank you. Aris Arugay, political scientist, University of the Philippines. I have a question for Mr. Yari and maybe um, a representative of both uh, in the Middle East and in our Southeast Asian colleagues. For Mr. Yari, what could be the most practical? Um, you mentioned that there was no legacy of citizenship uh, when the Arab Spring happened. So what could be the most practicable basis of citizenship for, for um, um, in the Middle East, in the region? Uh, and the second question, has there been an appreciation or recognition of the varieties of Islam within the Middle East and Southeast Asia and across these two regions among Western countries like the U.S. and countries in Europe? Just the recent uh, burning of the Jordanian pilot life, will that be a turning point or game changer for the ISIS dynamic in the Middle East? I think um, uh, it's an important question, my friend, about the citizenship. And I think... Uh, 
Fortunately, uh, uh, one Arab country, uh, which is Tunisia, is leading the way. What you had in Tunisia, what, what is citizenship to me, the shorter version is political participation. And in Tunisia, we have reached a situation that the Muslim Brotherhood, because the new citizens went, took to the square, this is a regime that I personally call squareocracy. This is the new system of governance. Because the people in Tunisia went to the square, the Muslim Brotherhood had to give up power. The same happened in Egypt in a different way. But in Tunisia, they were able to hold elections, parliamentary and presidential elections again, without too much violence, and create a, uh, and establish a, a coalition. I think the one country which is on the way to becoming a real democracy with a real spirit of citizenship uh, is Tunisia. And Tunisia should be encouraged as uh, an example, as a model. The question of citizenship is a bit uh, problematic because, as mentioned in the initial uh, part of all this talk, <coughs> the, the, the countries in the Middle East they are new, new states. Actually, the boundaries are artificial. It's foreign countries came and drawn a map and made this country and the other country. So it's, what is Iraq about? It's like, uh, taking three parts and making them one state. What is, what is Lebanon? That there is nothing in history that has some uh, tradition of statehood. We can exclude here Egypt, Iran, maybe Turkey, but the others are very problematic. So there is no this concept of citizenship also in the tradition of Islam. The identity of people is not by nationality, but by religion. So there is identity of being Muslim, Shia, and Sunni, and within them different groups. So this is also a new, a new, a new term. The other point that I would say that I, I'm glad that I'm here, and actually uh, Israel is not a big issue. For years we were trying to start to explain to the world that the Middle East has different conflicts. Of course, with all the respect to this issue of Palestine, I fully agree that this issue should be addressed, and the sooner the better. But the Middle East has so many different conflicts. And I think that after years, I think the world is becoming more and more aware that really Israel is not the issue. When I spoke about Iran, you know, the Islamic Revolution is against Israel. But Israel is, is not a major issue. It's, it's a peanut, or maybe speak about it, and I it's a pistachio. It's, it, Israel is half of Tehran, so it's not really this Islamic movement is not against Israel. It is against Western civilization. I think the, uh, the, con the concept has been, and still is, that the world has been based, or Western world was based on two pillars, communist Soviet Union and capitalist America. One of them has gone the term of the other is soon to come. Islam is the ideology of the future. I don't mind if this will be the case, but the question is which Islam? And there are so many different models of Islam, and we have to make sure that the others will get more prominence. Okay, any um, last words? Uh, and deeper union and uh, Tantri Johar, last word. I'm, I'm a Muslim, uh, but I don't identify myself with some the Islam that uh, uh, propagate violence. And he, I mean, that's, that's really the, the, the battle um, among Muslims is that there, there are different strains of Islam. It's not just Sunnis and uh, Shiism. We talk about hundreds and hundreds. Uh, some of them believe in Sharia, some of them believe in, in Ummah, some of them believe in the, uh, and some of them also alternately believe in the use of violence. Uh, but. What is happening in the Islamic world, in the Muslim community today across the world, is it's a battle for the soul of the hearts and mind of the people. And my hope, you know, I cannot claim that I'm I'm a better Islam than the others. Uh, that's for for no one to to uh, to decide. Uh, I cannot say those violent uh, uh, groups as not Islam because I, I always say that Islam we we are a peaceful religion. 
in the same way that they cannot claim that I'm not Muslim because I don't believe in what they believe. Uh, so, but what is happening now, and I think this is the, the real battle is uh, within the Muslim community, is really for the soul and the hearts and mind. And my hope is that, you know, uh, at the end of the day, the, the good guys will win. It's, it's a battle, but it's, we have recognized that this is going on, and uh, we just have to keep fighting. Tan Sri Chua, brief last word. Very brief, okay. <laughs> uh, just uh, some clarification. Those people who are going from Southeast Asia to West Asia, they are not just joining IS. They are also joining some other groups like Aharar al Sharab uh, and Jabhat al Nusra. So it's not all ISIS, number one. Number two, there are about 12,000 foreign fighters. Most of them come from the Arabic region. But 3,000, 25% come from Europe. Very few come from Southeast Asia, relatively speaking. That doesn't make the problem less serious. But we must see things in perspective. Number three, try to go beyond Islam and Muslims. Try to look at the political and social economic roots of this uh, you know, uprisings and movements, including in southern Thailand. So uh, I think we have to look at all these things and then we'll get a better picture of what the problem really is and how do we successfully address them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, it's been an interesting session. I thought that we would have a lot of questions and comments. This, this, this would generate a lot of controversy. Uh, perhaps it has, but uh, I think we, we are interested in, in learning and uh, for the first time, I think uh, uh, we have experts from the region here bringing the issues closer to the home to Southeast Asia, but especially to Thailand. So this is an exercise in raising awareness, awareness and consciousness that issues from far away uh, impinge on our lives here in Thailand. And uh, it's an honor for me to do this uh, at July. I think that the, the university is very pleased that we can host uh, an event like this on the Middle East, uh, beyond the news, beyond the headlines. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Jonathan uh, Spire, uh, Mr. Ehu Yari, Professor Manashri, Hun Kui Chongki Tawan, Andy Bayuni, and Tan Sri Johan. Please uh, join me in thanking the speakers today.